Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, this is Tigran Arkelian. I have Wadada Leo Smith with me. Welcome to Off the Podium. Uh, thank you, Tigran. I'm welcome. I'm glad to be here, and I welcome the opportunity to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, dive into the search of information. Yeah. Well, uh, the first thing, you know, I loved your website and especially the part about your philosophy and your thoughts on music. Uh, and uh, I was reading and it said that you, over the past couple of years, you've been thinking a lot about the word improvisation. And, you know, I, I was able to read it on your website and I'm sure other people will maybe go, go to it and, and check it out. But I want to get your thoughts. Why is it such a conflicting thing for you to think about the word improvisation? All right. Let me get begin at the beginning. In the days of 391 BC in Rome, they had some practice of the idea of improvisation, okay? And we don't know what it was, but it's the first time that the word was being used. So, so it kind of entered the, uh, the species of communication around that time, okay? And a little bit later in the 16th and 18th century, in uh, still in in Italy, began they began to have these street plays that was created around the idea of improvisation, and I believe that what was happening in Rome in the 391 was also had to do with theater because this portion here in the 16th through the 18th was theater. Well, in 1890, the theorists began to pop up, mm -hmm. and mostly Russian and French, and it was all about theater. Mm. Okay. Now, when the the early music coming out of um, the turn of the century, New, New Orleans, uh, rather, I call it the whole Southern Cradle because it happened in New Orleans, it happened in Mississippi, Alabama, and all the way across that Southern range, you see. Um, Raiders took the easy way out. They just grabbed a word. In fact, they grabbed two words that was that was completely wrong to imply. One of them was called jazz, and the other one was called uh, uh, this notion about that they were improvising. If you read the, the, the uh, interviews of all the early players, they never used the word improvisation. Mm -hmm. They never used it. Okay. And so I tried to take that word to its highest kind of a form of, of, uh, of uh, let's say, communication, which includes explanation and also uh, technique and uh, uh, the results of those two, okay? Um, so that's what I taught in schools for 30 some years in universities and, and independent spaces, okay? And then um, I began to question it uh, about five years ago, or five or six years ago. And the question that came to me was, uh, it seemed like the word improvisation well, I tell you the last time that, that really spurred me to move forward from improvisation. I read about the uh, 10 compositions that uh, uh, Kadensky did, the Russian uh, 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 painter, okay? And in there, he talks up composition and he downgrades improvisation. And he, he talks it up in a way that has had something to do with uh, little culture and large culture, okay? And I said that that was enough. That was a good point in which to trigger an eclipse from this word that never meant anything anyway to this community until, of course, academia got a hold to it. And now nobody would drop it except me. And that's great because I love being in a building or in an apartment or in a house or in a, in a mountain by myself, you see. So, so I, I dropped it and then I began to think about what was a creation? What, what, no, what should this be called? Mm -hmm. And I realized this, that a creative piece of music or a piece of music that had been made by somebody in the present moment from start to finish and I'm not talking about free improvisation. I'm not talking about harmonic progression because those are limited reference when you think about making music, okay? Um, but what happens when that art object un is unveiled and, and those who are checking it out receive it? 
And what happens is it creates a moment that I characterize just like when the Almighty created creation, although much, much, much smaller, you see, and has less impact, okay? But it's the same principles. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a connection with inspiration. And if you look through the text in the Quran and the Bible and many other spiritual books, when they talk about knowledge being revealed, it, it comes through inspiration, you see. And so, so, so the connection with the big creation and all the other kinds of notion about creation has to do with receiving and able to interpret and release that inspiration into an object. Now, let me read you this. This is what I found. Create, to cause to come into being something unique that would not naturally evolve. Something that's not made by ordinary principles or process. That's important. You won't find anything as clear and as direct and as provoking when you look up the word improvisation. I don't care what kind of context you look at it in. You never find anything like that. And, and this idea of uh, inspiration, the word that most aptly describes its notion is epiphany, okay? A sudden intuitive perception of or insight into the reality or the essential meaning of something. So it says it's a sudden influx and it's non-material because it's intuitive and it gives the complete thing in that short bust of energy, okay? Those two, inspiration and epiphany, they are most important in this concept or this notion or this philosophy or idea about create for me. And that's it in a nutshell. Wow. And uh, you mentioned something about colleges, and I know you've been teaching at various universities, Cal Arts all over the country, uh, and master classes all over the world. How, how do colleges, especially in younger students, take on everything that you're saying? How, are, they, are they accepting, or do you, do you get some, you know? Um... They are like the musicians that, that teach them, uh -huh. and they are like the musicians that they respect. Uh -huh. They hear me out. But constantly during the conversation, they use the word improvisation. Mm. And usually what I tell them that it's, it's okay to use it, you see. Just understand that what I'm talking about is not an exchange of words. I'm not replacing improvisation with the word create, okay? Because that's a semantic juncture of stuff. I'm not looking for that. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is, is defining what I believe to be the essence of how human beings create something, no matter whether it's a piece of music or an architectural uh, construction of a building or how you design uh, a vaccine for a virus. Mm -hmm. It all has to do with these kind of things. Yeah. And, and, and revealed knowledge cannot be engaged through um, reasoning and thinking or thought or the intellect. It's a knowledge that, that supersedes that. Mm. Acquired knowledge can be acquired through those things, you see, but they cannot, they cannot take you to this uh, real zone. And the same thing about inspiration. The inspiration, when it comes in, there's no definition in between it and who receives it. It's, it's a straight line. And in the practice of, in the present moment of creating, it goes in, and it goes right out and between that space of which we can't see uh, uh, the construction of its meaning is released through music in this case since we're talking about music wow and and uh, the amazing thing is that your first album what did you call your first album six solo improvisation huh wow it was creative music you see you yeah say, and creative music six solo improvisation that, and that's what I was going to. I was to. halfway there, uh -huh. uh, and whenever that was, 19-something, I don't know when it was. 72, I think. 70 or something. something. Yeah. I was halfway there, you see. But what I've learned is this, is that 
the human being grows from the moment that they are, have been conceived uh -huh. and born and live up until they pass on. And we don't know about that state over past the zone of life. But I, being a Muslim, I believe that there is still more knowledge being revealed and used during that state past this, this zone of living. And, and one, uh, one more question, again, not, not specifically for the word improvisation, but for mm -hmm. a program that you created at CalArts, which was the African-American Improvisation Program. Right. How did that come about? And how was, you know, I mean, it didn't exist before. And what does it even mean to have African-American Improvisation Program? All right. It means this. Um, when I was at Bard College, mm -hmm. I began to introduce this idea about uh, improvisation at the time. And of course, um, uh, uh, I had to fit within the context of the music department. It was ran by Joan Tower at the time. Benjamin Boix and Joan Tower was co-runners of it until there was a coup. And after the coup, Ben was out, they gave him his own program called Program Zero. And Joan took over the music department, but still I'm part of the music department. So I tried to juxtapose these notions about uh, African-American improvisation uh, language. And then of course it never was accepted. But then some problems happened at the school and they didn't decide to rehire me, uh, even though I'd been there five years and even though I never failed an evaluation they needed to get rid of me, and which was fine. But in the meantime, uh, David Rosenboom at Cal Arts mm -hmm. and I had started communicating, and I had gotten a job there. Okay, and so when I went there, I went there with this program. Mm -hmm. I I introduced it to to the provost, the um, the dean, which was David Rosenboom, and Stephen Levine, who was the president of the college. And they all were excited about it. Okay. But they said, like, wow, well, wow, well, where can we get the money from? Okay. And that's the usual uh, pitch that comes when they are not going to do it. They say that, okay, we don't have the budget. How can we get the money to do this? And so that means no. Mm. I understood that. And then later after I've been there, well, I came there as, as uh, through Herb Alford the trumpet player and a um, uh, very important person for education today. Um, I came there through him. I was made the Herb Alford, uh, chair, no, the Dizzy Gillespie chair, which Herb Alford funded. And he had funded it for five years as a chair and he was supposed to renew it. But I got a wind of the fact that he had been convinced not to renew it because the music department wanted to build a studio. Mm -hmm. So rather than putting some more millions of dollars into the Dizzy's chair, they put $10 million into the studio, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, that was fine. I went out and got me another job. I got a job at Mears College, just like that. I, I took the same program to them. They listened to it and they were like, stung is like like a like a bee had stung all of them and then they says uh, yeah we would like to have this here mm. and um and basically offered me the job mm. and then the word got back to david and of course david and, and stephen got together and stephen told me to give him five days and he will uh, figure out what to do mm. and within three or four days he got the thing fixed so that I could stay there and all the money I needed and also uh, extra stuff, mm -hmm. which meant now that they can pay for my program. And they did, wow. you see. So, so that program uh, was, was designed as a master program. And each of the students in order to graduate, they had to do a master performance and they also had to do a thesis. And the thesis could not be about anybody else's music. It had to be about them and their music, right. or them and their awakening to their music. And they also had to analyze their own major uh, master performance right. in text, I mean, in, in written text. And that counted for 
sixty percent. The thesis counted for sixty percent of the uh, of the graduating uh, uh, count. Mm. Okay, and it was the first thesis program at Carolina that that needed to have a thesis, and it was and the thesis chair was the first chair. Mm. Okay, but before I retired, they had chairs everywhere. <laughs> And thesis everywhere, you see. Um, um, and because the whole notion was, is from my perspective, is that a student that's involved with creativity have to know how to talk about it, yeah. how to write about it. And both of those inquire that student to engage some kind of thought and reflection on it. Yeah. And that was the motivation. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I even started this podcast a couple of years ago is because I've realized I just want musicians to be able to speak and articulate about what they feel and what they think about music. And, and that's the reason why I love your work so much and I've been inspired by it is because uh, you are a, not only a wonderful and amazing musician, but you're also a thinker. And I, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, your program uh, that you worked on did that so well, but what can we do for the future generations to be not only just amazing musicians, but think about it and be able to express it through, through words? What can we do? Well, I was hoping that, 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 that the basis for a new generation of, of artists and thinkers would have came out of my, uh, my program. I, I, I guess I had something like 25 or 30 kids that graduated in that over five years. Normally there was four or five uh, uh, students in that program at a time. At one time as high as eight, but four or five was the normal count of it, you see. And, um, um, uh, I also instituted like a, what it was we call the Electronic Creative Music Ensemble at Carolina, which was involved in reading opera summation scores. And the team of both computer uh, uh, musicians and instrumental musicians would work collaboratively to perform those opera summation pieces every single session. But as a result of the performance, they would have to discuss like scientists, a round table discussion like scientists about the success and failure of that particular session that day. And that would open them up to all kinds of uh, ways of thinking. That was my, hopefully I was thinking that that would open them up for thinking of, about being critical enough to evaluate what they did for just that session and, and to put it into their notebook and write about it as well. So that at the end of the semester, they would have a diary of their thoughts and practice during that semester. So the writing context and the discussive quality of the stuff was constantly in the foreground of the performers, the thinking about it, writing about it, and the talking about it. All three of them matched themselves in a, in a good balanced way. Yeah. Well, uh, going back to the current situation, a little bit away from your music, but at the same time, it is affecting your music uh, because uh, we're in a situation where we can't perform, we can't, you know, teach, go out and do master classes. Um, what are you? What are you currently? How are you currently dealing with the current situation? Well, I I kind of welcome it, um, not the pandemic, but the idea of staying in the house. Uh, I've basically been in the house for seven weeks. I started a week before the country began to say that we need to lock down. I knew that we need to lock down just because uh, if there's something out there that's happening, and they, they don't know what it is. And we know that because they call it a novelty virus uh, that they have no information on. So I locked down already. My daughter brings me food and stuff when I run out or get close to running out. And I go out from time to time to get medication and stuff like that, but I have a good sufficient mask and gloves on. And um, uh, I work uh, in the seven weeks in the house. I've made three large uh, approximation scores, 40 inches by 26 inches, two of them that size, and one 30 inches by 22 inches. And I have another one on the board that's that's waiting to be done. Yeah. I've written three um, note-based compositions uh, about the Coronas. Mm. Okay, 
um, uh, that when I say about the corona, it's about the people that are dealing with uh, the people who are responding in this uh, 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 essential workers, those people who are keeping us alive and feeding us and et cetera, you see. And so I've done, so that means that I've done really like six pieces of music in these seven weeks. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I've worked a little bit on my memoirs. I've worked a little bit on uh, uh, the complete notes. I have a book that's called Eight Notes, uh, New World Music, Creative Music, something, something. There's two, two editions of it. And I've been working on for the last couple of years, the final and complete edition that we have all three versions inside of one, one volume. So I work on stuff like that and, um, you know, I, I enjoy it. I have an exercise uh, machine downstairs in my little office. I go down there and I walk for 30 minutes or 35 minutes, four or five times a week. I am, it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I don't have no regrets. Um, for those who don't know, you mentioned your graphic scores. Uh, why don't you talk about how you came to the realization of doing that and how you put that together? Because not many people know, but I think that's a very big and important part of your legacy. It is. Uh, and and to, to, to be more clear, I call them symbolic language scores, mm -hmm. okay. not graphic scores. And the reason for that is that uh, a graphic score generally speaking, coming from all of the, the uh, early pioneers of that, Earl Brown and uh, uh, John Cage and, and a bunch of yeah. uh, early, early uh, artists, mm -hmm. none of them had specifics about how you perform them. And none of them had anything that dealt with the rate of success of how well it was done. Yeah. Of course, Cage would walk out angrily when one wasn't done well. But that's a physical something. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, an instruction about how you measure success and failure of one of those scores. Whereas a language score, it's based off of communication. Mm -hmm. It has specific language that must be used and understood and expressed as part of its success uh, of being executed in the proper way. And afterwards, you can relate to who has been successful and who is not, who has not, you see. Yeah. And so the language scores came about um, primarily, and, and many students asked me, did you do this? Because the note music was not enough, or could not express what you wanted, wanted to do. And the answer is, is no, that is not the reason because note music, uh, music with notes, uh, they express everything you want, you want to be expressed. All you got to do is put it there, you see. I found that the approximation came through me. It was a journey of three or four years before I even wrote the first piece. Mm -hmm. And the first piece was The Bell, which was written in 1967. Mm -hmm. I was in the army from 19, I forget when, but I started looking at this stuff in 1964. How do you find this something that I feel is important to be found? I don't know what it looked like. I don't know what you're going to call it. I don't know anything about it except that I know I want to find something that needs to be found. Okay. And uh, I started looking through all kinds of books that had scores in them. Every library that I came across, I went and looked for scores. And I looked in these books to see if I saw anything that would match my inner urgent urge to do, just to see. And nothing was there, okay? And so afterwards, I started trying to just draw. I would draw intuitively, okay? And whatever that session produced, it was just generally balled up and thrown in the garbage because I wasn't satisfied with it. And then in 1967, I got out of the army. Okay. I go to Chicago, and one Saturday morning, I'm sitting in my apartment in Old Town, Chicago, and I'm working on this piece, and something come to me. And at the end of the, the, the uh, structure, 
I put a dotted box with some material in there that had X's on them. I didn't know what to do except for the X's. And they still had beams. They looked like 16s and 8 notes and stuff like that, but they had X's on. I put them in there. And um, I still don't know how to use it. I go through rehearsal. I'm telling the guys, uh, Anthony Braxton, Leroy Jenkins, and Mua Richard Abrams, who recorded it with me, that uh, uh, interpret the way that you want to interpret it. Let's see what we get. And so when we recorded it, on the playback was the first time I had this epiphany about what it was that was the rhythm music, which was the first element to come in the Akrasmation language. And the rhythm music came purely uh, where Anthony and Leroy and Muha and I, we stroked the first several of them as we thought they should be. Moore stroked another one by himself. I stroked another one. He stroked another one. I stroked another one. And in that moment, I realized that what was being happening, what was happening then was an exchange of rhythm that is an audible sound and silence. Mm. And later, those two principles became the fundamental principles for the rhythm units and other aspects of the uh, Across Mason language. So I just I decided that after that, that a rhythm unit had an audible portion and a silent portion. And that that silent portion was relatively equal to the audible portion. And it had a set of six sets uh, going from one through six. And that each set was progressively shorter in execution. And the relationship between each set was, again, uh, long and short. Because the inner relationship between the audible and the silence is long and short. And the relationship between each set is long and short. And so each set, if you, if you map one out to the next one, and you map the first one out to the third one, or the first one out to the sixth one, all the relationship, inner and the larger structure, is long and short relationship. Mm. And, and that became important because when you play, let's say, um, uh, the piece I wrote for Leroy Jenkins uh, back here, maybe, I don't know, eight years, nine years ago, it's on, it's on cuneiform records. Um, the whole piece was nothing but rhythm units. And when you got a piece with that many rhythm units in it, the, no, the long and short relationship worked out perfectly because no one had to remember how long the last set was. Wow. All they had to do was execute the next set. Mm -hmm. And the law of relativity, each set would be by and large long and short, you see? And that created the mobility of these rhythm. And then the next stage was I had to define these rhythms because everybody's trying to tell me, well, how can I count this? Well, you don't count it. And you say, well, why not? Because it's, how, can you, how can you use the word rhythm? But then I, I did a little exploring and I come up with this idea that rhythm exists in two forms. And basically one is metrical, okay? And one is proportional. And metrics has two forms, even and odd, and proportion has two forms, long and short. And so as I'm going along and being challenged by people who wants to think of the easy path towards doing something, that I've shown them how it might work, the challenge forces me to find new territory, new material to explain that, that kind of uh, wow. environment. Wow. That's amazing. And uh, actually, you mentioned Anthony Braxton. I want to I want to get some of your thoughts about him as a musician and your musician and your collaborations with him over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the second part of the question, I, I know you've done completely solo albums where you've been on your own on an album, including your first album. But also you've done uh, uh, some collaborations with just one other artist on the album. I'm thinking those are like the most difficult things to do. But when you have like six or seven people in the band, you're, you just have a little bit more a chance of just letting go of things. But when you just have one or two people, it's just, it makes it really difficult. What are your thoughts? 
Well, my thoughts is that uh, one of the one of the shining principles of the AECM was that an artist should have the responsibility and the capability of performing solo and in ensemble context, that is smaller ensembles and in larger orchestral context. And um, nearly every single AECM member during my generation there uh, took that to heart. And one of the things that you would have to do as an AECM member, not force, but in order to stand amongst the rest of the players there, you would have to perform a solo performance, you see. And we all did it. I mean, from Roscoe to Lester Boyd to Mohaw, every one of us did it, you see. And when you, when you began to perform solo, you began to understand something about music that frees you up from the uh, reliance on somebody else, okay? You begin to uh, uh, be concealed in this unit of the self, both the shell of it, which protects you, and the inner part of it, which receives the inspiration. Mm -hmm. You begin to feel really uh, uh, confident and really collective. And when you rejoin the ensemble, on any occasion, you are much more aware of the various layers within the context of the ensemble that you're performing in. You're much more aware of it. It opens up you to hear, but not listen, you see, which is two different things. It opens up for you to hear everything that's going on stage, but you hear it in a context that it's, it's, it's an informative uh, uh, cloud, let's say, but your contribution to it is the biggest cloud, mm. you see. And then it evolves and it evolves and evolves. Whereas when people get caught into listening to what the next player is doing, they lose their own center. Oh. They're unable to, to really respond to themselves. So what happens is the action of actually performing becomes this kind of habituous uh, motor uh, process that's, that, that, that that creates uh, uh, rather that 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 destroys the possibility of creating. Mm. And you've mentioned in in a past interview that uh, playing in an orchestra, you kind of lose yourself. You you don't you don't you don't have your own identity to contribute. So yeah, you don't have it. But if you if you if you played solo, you can find a way to find that out yeah. and to make that part of of, yeah. of the of the avenue of your expression. Because when you play solo, you don't just follow the path of the energy that's, that's being created by the full orchestra. Yeah. You follow a specific uh, notion of adding to that musical realm at the time, something that's special. And you don't try to control the flow of it. You see, you let your inspiration be the powerful one yeah. that actually triggers where the music go and not the individual. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, something, you know, a little bit off topic, but if we were to open your phone or your computer, uh, what would be the last, you know, four or five tracks that you've been listening to or songs or pieces? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that. Um, uh, let me say it this way and I hope I don't get lost, but um, for the last seven years, I've been in the studio recording at least eight times a year. Okay. I have volumes and volumes of music that will, that um, I have volumes of music that could come out for the next 10 or 15 years. Okay. As a result of doing that. And I've been, I have to listen every year, multiple times to all of these kinds of projects to make them to say that this should be that, or that should be that. And since being in-house, uh, I have not listened to any music whatsoever. Uh, I heard a piece just the other day at the end of a movie that struck my attention, and I'd never heard it in my life. And it was, um, it was Love and Happiness by Al Green. Mm. And it was one of the most moving moments of these seven weeks inside the house uh, that I experienced with this audio 
occasion of listening and also being engrossed into it because uh, normally at the end of the move, I just flip it over. But when this piece came on, I didn't even know it was Al Green. I was like, wow, I wonder who is that? Let me see what this is. And I listened and I listened to all the way to the end of it. And I'm, I still don't know who it is. Okay, but I do know one thing. It was masterfully sung and it was through inspiration because there's some create in there that he's using. Okay, I can tell because when you when the create comes in, it automatically increases the communication level of the piece. Hmm. And so I looked through every single credit line and it was at the absolute end. It is says Marvin Gaye, not Marvin Gaye, but Al, Al Green. Yeah. And I was, I was, I was um, delighted. Uh, I called my daughter and told her that uh, uh, I just heard this, this uh, love and happiness by Al Green. You got to hear it. Yeah. You know? Well, uh, three, you know, inspirational, influential figures in our lives are, you know, sometimes musicians, sometimes non-musicians. Who are some of the most influential people in your life? Well, starting at the age of 13, Marcus Aurelius was one, other than my, my parents. Uh, I started reading his meditation at, at 13. I bought the book basically because it was a hardcover and uh, I had ordered it on, on, out of a magazine. And um, I ordered it because it looked beautiful. I had no idea who Marcus Aurelius was. I had no, uh, uh, in fact, I had to look up the word meditation to see exactly what it meant. Okay. But when I started reading it and he started talking about the characters of his parents and uncles and people like that, and started talking about the good, the relationship of those things which are good for you and stuff like that, it was, it was fascinating. Okay, and of course, uh, at that same time zone, uh, I ordered five records. Okay, and the five records I ordered was was uh, uh, Billie Holiday, maybe Lady Sang the Blues. I'm not sure what it was then, but it was a, a collection of her stuff by Columbia, and uh, uh, Michael Legrand. The one that he had with that had Cannonball, Miles Davis, Art Farm, and all those people on there, and uh, kind of blue, and uh, something else. There, there, there was two other ones that that I ordered, but essentially, I ordered just off of visual images some of the most powerful records I've ever heard in my life. Mm. And I listened to that music, and that music helped to shape my early, early zone. In addition to the main source of my inspiration, which came from my stepfather, who was a blues master, and the whole environment of the Delta, uh, the the art music there was blues music, both instrumental and uh, uh, poetry and philosophical base songs. Um, well, maybe you if I move further down the line. I do it fastly. Charles Ives is another powerful influence of uh, mine. Wow. Uh, uh, of course, Louis Armstrong, uh, Miles Davis, um, uh, Duke Ellington, and Count Basie. And Count Basie, because he was the first guy that really showed how space and silence worked in music. And I was just gonna say, especially uh, even uh, with that, but e even with Charles Ives, when I listen to your music, the the way you use space, for some reason, even before you mentioned, I was gonna say it sounds like Charles Ives, not sounds like Charles Ives, but the way you 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 you're able to use space, which is so important in music. Yeah, yeah, Ives was a great was a great composer. He only made one mistake in his life, and uh, he was a wealthy man. He should have he should have uh, he should have built him an orchestra with his money mm -hmm. and he should have built him a performing space with his money because he was a millionaire yeah and he should have had every single piece of music he had performed yeah and if he had did that we wouldn't have heard columbus and the gems in every piece <laughs> we wouldn't have heard that yeah. but even with that his sonatas are some of the most beautiful music on the planet uh uh, 
three places in New England. There's no orchestra music as beautiful as that. The only one that compete, can compete with that as beauty would be the Lemur mm -hmm. by, by Debussy for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, uh, the string quartets are, are fantastic. You know, uh, the brass music, you know, it goes on and on, yeah. you know. And the only person that has a has a category of music that's that's so dynamic uh, uh, in terms of, of the way in which they understood inspiration are the two composers, Bach and Ellerton. Hmm. And then if I would jump forward, it would be Coltrane and Davis, Miles Davis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I'm I'm so I'm so shocked to hear Charles Ives uh, on on your list. Um, oh, yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm, I look. I've, I've understood Charles Ives music. I've listened to it. I have everything that he's ever recorded that's ever been recorded of his music. Um, uh, Charles Amaconian, I believe it was, uh, showed me his uh, his his uh, scores from his um, Music of the Spheres. Hmm. And it wasn't completed. I, I think it was done later by some other guy that did it. I forget his name, but he was at the San Diego. I forget his name. Mm -hmm. But in any case, that music has been recorded, at least after being finished. And um, so I've heard all that music, you know. Uh, MJQ with, with John Lewis, one of the most fantastic composers of his time, mm -hmm. with his own research center right in front of him. Well, a life-changing moment for you, whether it's a musical moment or a personal moment that you're willing to share with us. Uh, life-changing moments. Uh, uh, well, the most important one I would say is uh, when I realized that uh, uh, I had taken the right name and I had joined the right religion. And by right, I mean the religion that, that was destined for me to join. Mm. I went to Hodge in 2000, somewhere around there. And um, during the Hodge, uh, you do all these ceremonies and stuff like that. And the Tawaf and going around at the seven courses, on the last day there, uh, at least the day before the last day, we all do the Tawaf around, okay? And I did the Tawaf around on the top level. And that's the, that's the longest. It took hours and hours and hours. And I did it because it was so crowded, okay? And when I come down through the stairway with thousands and thousands of people, I said to myself, as I got to this doorway to go out, I said, let me look up and see which door I'm going out so that I can remember this just in case I come back again. And I looked up and the door was called the door of Ishmael. Okay. My Islamic name uh, is Ishmael Ali Shabazz. Mm -hmm. So that door going out of that said Ishmael, Ishmael and 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 um, Abraham repaired the mosque mm -hmm. after it had originally been built by I wrote the cover after it had originally been built by Abraham. Mm. You see? Yeah. Wow. I mean, sorry, Adam had been originally built by Adam, you see. Um, so that says a lot to me. Wow. Well, that might be something, you know, these are some of the standard questions I ask, but that's that might be something uh, that you might have the same answer for my next question. But uh, what is something that your fans, people who follow your career, don't know about you? A hobby, it could be a hobby or anything, really. Well, what they don't know about me is that the incredible amount of research that goes into every piece. Yeah. And that I never, ever uh, start or finish a piece without solving some kind of problem. Mm. Wow. And, and with all the, all the collaborations, all the recordings that you've done, what is something that you just have in the back of your mind? You're like, you know, I really want to collaborate with that one artist. I really want to write a piece that's specific to this instrumentation. What is one thing that you have in the back of your mind that you haven't done yet? If anything. Um, well, there are things like, like um, I have a, I have a evolving piece that, that 
that should have nine different ensembles. And um, I started in last, last uh, uh, November, I believe it was November, last May, I started last May, in May and November to record one project of it, one part of it, and I have eight more ensembles to go. Okay, but who would I record with? Uh, right now, um, I'm going to reshape the question a little bit. Okay. The two most uh, powerful journeys in recording happened with the duo recording of Anthony Braxton and I. Mm -hmm. That was a live performance at the old um, old Stone. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was done in one night, but we we made two. There were two, there were two CDs that came out with it. Yeah. Okay, uh, and the duet with VJ Ayer mm -hmm. and I, mm -hmm. and the 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 consequences of that CD, the two or three tours that we've had on that music. What I discovered from these two artists is that they are, uh, our communication is the absolute best on stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, to pick one or the other would not be necessary because both of them are uh, uh, my favorite uh, uh, collaborators. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And I've had Ayer on my podcast before. Uh, I think it was about a month ago, and that was a fantastic com a conversation. Hopefully, I'll have Anthony Braxton because I'm a big fan, and I would love to have him on. Um, I'll reach out and try to get him on the podcast as well. Thank you so much for joining me. Is there anything else you want to add before we end? Yes, live music is very important. But if you can't have live music, make it anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day. Yes, thank you. Peace out. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.